there's no way that she could have really been looking out for him as a friend when he's going through these mental health issues and these financial issues. And you certainly don't turn around and sue your friend's estate for $135 million on just... One was a movie deal, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah. Generally speaking, your friends don't sue your estate when you pass. Your friends are willing to overlook any sort of... Right, right. And she was claiming, too, that her services uh, every, you know, it was 30000 a day. Which, that seems extreme. Yes, and looking through some of her claims, it sounded like maybe she didn't have an attorney when she filed these or they weren't properly vetted, but some of the claims she are making is just outrageous. But the problem with going through probate and not having a will is that anyone can go and say, hey, 10 years ago, five years ago, you promised me this. And then it has to go to court and be heard. So anyone can come out of the woodwork if you don't have the proper documentation in place to make all of these absurd claims just like we're seeing here. Life's Third Act is a podcast dedicated to helping you get the most out of your retirement. Sponsored by Tucker Allen, attorney CPA Joe Cordell features guests each week to discuss prominent topics for those over 55. Here's attorney CPA Joe Cordell. Welcome to another episode of Life's Third Act. We are going to take a look at a real life case that I guess you could say it really serves as a reason why it's so important to have your affairs in order before you die. And it's a really juicy case, a case that by all accounts could be made into a Hollywood movie. And here with us to help us break it all down is one of our favorite guests, Missy Manning, a Tucker Allen attorney. Thanks for joining us, Missy. Oh, and I also want to say, and be sure to like us on YouTube and subscribe or wherever you get your podcast. Okay, Missy, this case, it's about Tony Shea, Mm -hmm. um, a former CEO of Zappos. And in case you don't know about Zappos, it's an online retailer and uh, for clothing and shoes. So this man... Incredibly bright, Harvard graduate, um, successful entrepreneur, had an estate worth nearly a billion dollars, and he dies without a will, which— Shocking. It it really is. I mean, what do you make of that, that someone, you know— It's very surprising that no one anywhere down the line told him, hey, you really need to sit down and get your estate plan in order, even if you're very young, because he was admittedly very young when he passed. But 46. When you start making money like that, you need to have your affairs in order. Right, right. And, you know, he was also instrumental with the redevelopment of downtown Las Vegas. He had his hands in several business deals. And, And let's go back, though. I think we need to really talk about... What was happening with him prior to his death in 2020, uh, which was a suspicious fire, um, a mysterious fire, I guess you could say. And we'll talk about that in a moment. But according to his family members, he was spiraling out of control mentally. And he he had suffered from some mental health issues, social anxiety. Um, But it was in 2019, his family said he started experimenting with... um, ketamine and uh, also nitrous oxide. Uh, He was doing this through whippets, which I didn't even know what that was until... Neither did I. I guess I'm so naive. Yeah. But it's like a whipped cream can, and he was using that to inhale those drugs. And it was causing him to have hallucinations. Um, They they said that uh, he thought he could transform into animals and objects. Um, So clearly we were having some competency issues at the time due to his drug use and mental health. Right, right. And and there was another incident where the family said he tried to board a bus to Montana. He was only wearing pajama pants, no shoes, no shirt, no shoes, and he had a box of crayons. So... I mean, shouldn't the family have stepped in at some point and said, okay, we need to get him some help? 
We've talked before on this show about conservatorships. Correct. Would that have been appropriate? That would have been appropriate. Clearly, he was not able to make decisions that were in his best interest. His safety was, in fact, compromised many times with these issues. So it would have been a pretty easy thing to get a conservatorship or a guardianship over his person or finances, given all of his mental health issues and incidents like these where he's clearly not able to make informed and smart decisions for both his health and his finances. Right, right. And then there was his death in on uh, November 17th of 2020. By the way, November 17th is my birthday, so if you want to send me a present, I would love it. <laughs> um, but he's staying at this um, friend's house in Connecticut, Rachel Brown. And Rachel Brown was uh, some sort of executive with Zappos. And so... He, Rachel, his brother Andrew, and some other friends were staying there because the next day they were all taking a trip to Hawaii. Mm -hmm. And there was this report that came out about the fire itself. And they were staying there. Thank you. And this uh, story comes from the Associated Press. And Apparently, he and Rachel Brown got into an argument over the cleanliness of her house, which is kind of ironic because you remember reading what the family said about his mansion where he spent most of his time in Utah. Correct. It was littered with dog feces, glass. Um, He replaced electricity with candles, tiki torches. And he also had all these post-it notes um, on the mansion walls some were business deals, and, and some of the those who filed claims against his estate used those as evidence. But getting back to the fire, so he stays in—he he didn't want to stay in the house, so he goes into the shed, which is— Very oh, unusual. Bizarre, right. So he goes in there, and apparently there were two fires before the final fire, Um and and he was apparently doing drugs, smoking cigarettes, smoking marijuana. Um, they found the whippets again in there. And um, there was one fire that was started by, I think they said a blanket, got too close to a candle. It was minor. And uh, his brother and the friends came out and, you know, had been checking on him through the night, put that fire out. And then later on, he lit a plastic bag to stay warm. Well, started another fire. They put that one out. But they were checking on him throughout the night. It definitely sounds like he was not in his right mind when this happened. He couldn't have been. He he absolutely couldn't have been. And then the final fire is when apparently, and, and there's, you know, different, um, you know, uh, accounts on this that, the, the door got locked, and he, he he may have done that intentionally, and they tried to get him out. Um, his brother and the friends um, tried—they um, broke a window, and they used a fire extinguisher, but they were overcome from the smoke and all the ash. So he ends up dying in this fire, and the fire marshal's office was not able to, tr- to determine an exact cause of the fire because there was just so much involved. But— I would say the family would be able to use the circumstances surrounding this fire to prove that he was not in a good state of mind, you know, when he died and in the months leading up or even years leading up to his death. Did you think that helped their case when they countersued? Absolutely. So um, to hold someone accountable for some of these post-it notes and business deals that you had mentioned, he needs to be having the ability to make a contract. You can't hold like a child to a contract or someone who has been, I don't know, diagnosed with a severe mental illness who lacks capacity. Right. You can't hold them to a contract. And examples like these certainly help prove their case that he lacked the capacity to make those contracts and those business deals in the time leading up until his death. Okay. And let's talk about those. There was nearly a dozen people that filed claims against the estate. Um, And it I think it totaled like $130 million, something like that. And they were for some very interesting allegations. Right. And and his friend of 17 years who also claimed to be his longtime assistant and they were they had several business deals together, uh, Jennifer Mimi Pham. 
Yes. Um, and she said that they were so close that they shared addresses, uh, cell phone numbers. Uh, what do you make of her and her boyfriend, uh, Roberto Grande? Uh, they seem shady to me. I don't think they were really his friend. I don't think that there were... There's no way that she could have really been looking out for him as a friend when he's going through these mental health issues and these financial issues. And you certainly don't turn around and sue your friend's estate for $135 million on just... One was a movie deal, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah. Generally speaking, your friends don't sue your estate when you pass. Your friends are willing to overlook any sort of... Right, right. And she was claiming, too, that her services uh, every, you know, it was 30000 a day. Correct. Which, that seems extreme. Yes, and looking through some of her claims, it sounded like maybe she didn't have an attorney when she filed these or they weren't properly vetted, but some of the claims she are making is just outrageous. But the problem with going through probate and not having a will is that anyone can go and say, hey, 10 years ago, five years ago, you promised me this, and then it has to go to court and be heard. So anyone can come out of the woodwork if you don't have the proper documentation in place to make all of these absurd claims just like we're seeing here. What about the sticky notes that different people were using? I mean, is that, could that hold up? It's unlikely. First, not only do we have his capacity issues, but setting that aside, to have a legal contract over $500, you have to have it in writing with all the pertinent details. It is unlikely that he put all of sufficient details to make an actual legal contract for some of these things that are happening in, on a size of a sticky note. But it's possible. Yeah. Okay. And then what ended up happening, the case was settled, uh, I believe, in December of 2021 between the family and... Mimi Pham and her boyfriend, okay? And what ended up happening was those two had to pay the family $750,000 and they both, you know, dropped the lawsuits against each other. Why? I don't understand. He didn't give much detail. What was would be the reason for that? So I'm sure that there is some confidentiality behind their agreement, so they're not allowed to share. But what we can be- speculate is that when you're suing someone for $135 million and they turn around and countersue you, and you're the person who ends up paying, chances are her original $135 million worth of claims were just nonsense, and that she had done some wrongdoing in the past that has come back to bite her. For example, if she was involved in leading him to make any of these deals or taking money from him or any of these more Undue influence. Yeah, undue influence. All of this, chances are she was a bad actor before his death, and they had evidence of this that they would use to overcome her claims and make her pay them. So... Obviously, they had something on her and the boyfriend. Yes. It seems. That is a a pretty darn good guess. Okay. Okay. Now, after his death, um, a judge appointed his father, Richard, and his brother, Andrew, to um, to serve as administrators over the estate. Talk about what an administrator does exactly. So in Missouri, we have something a little bit different. We call them personal representatives. But I'm assuming that this is just a California thing. So this is the person who's basically the executor who's in charge of moving the estate through the probate process. Okay. So they get to deal with all of these fun claims like this of all these people coming out of the woodwork trying to claim pieces of his estate. And do we know if any other claims have been settled? I mean, there's still, you know, probably eight other people. So this is still something that has to work through. It's a process. Correct. And this is part of the reason why if he had something in place, um, things would move along much faster like with a trust, for example. Now that we've got to go through probate, the judge has to oversee each and every one of these claims and all of the arguments for him. So it'll probably be years before this probate case is settled. Okay. But we know, though, whatever is left, the family will get. Correct. Since there is no will or trust in place, it goes according to California law. Um, My understanding was that he was not married and he did not have kids. Correct? Right. He did not. Uh, There was a girlfriend, I think, but no. We don't recognize girlfriends or boyfriends in the eyes of the law for a probate. So the money would probably go to his parents if they're still alive. So his dad. And then possibly out to his siblings. Just kind of depends upon what the intestate probate statute says in California. 
Okay, okay. I'm curious about something. If once this is all settled and say they find a will somewhere, could that impact, I mean, could this be reopened? So if they find a will in Missouri, the statute is one year. So if they find it within one year of his death, then that will is still good and they can go ahead and revisit things and make changes. Hopefully that doesn't happen after they're this far along the process, but it can happen. In Missouri, though, if your will is not found within one year of your death, it's no longer good even if you find it two years later or three years later. We've already moved along. Okay. Once it's closed, it's closed. So one year after death. Yep. One year. Okay. Okay. Gotcha. Well, we're going to come back, take a commercial break. And when we return, we're going to bring in another Tucker Allen attorney, Nina Windsor. Strong roots are essential for a healthy tree, especially your family tree. That's why you work hard to take care of your family every day. At Tucker Allen, we know that taking care of your family means planning for the future. Our team provides personalized estate planning to help ensure that your family and your legacy are protected and that your future is secure. From wills and trusts to long-term care and estate planning. Count on Tucker Allen. Personalized estate planning made simple. We're back and we have Nina Windsor, another attorney with Tucker Allen. I'm surrounded by two great legal minds. And this is your debut on Life's Third Act. It is. I'm really happy to be here. We're happy to have you. So first of all, what is your take about all this? I mean, it is well, it's got the makings of a lifetime movie, I think. It does. Um, but we're seeing more and more of these types of cases. And, you know, sometimes they don't get this far into court and there aren't as many related claims. But a lot of times there really um, are very dramatic happenings when somebody who's rich passes away without a will or a trust in place. And it, it happens far more than it should, given how much they probably pay to have a lot of their other affairs in order. Do you find that um, you get many cases that come across your desk like that, where a family member will say, look, my uh, dad or my brother passed away, no will, what do we do? So we do have that, and we also have uh, points where people will pass away and they had a trust, but they never put anything in it. So we have um, people who have actually paid to have some estate planning done and then not done the follow-up work to revisit their assets over time and make sure the beneficiary designations were appropriate. So in this case, no one had any documentation, and that does happen. I mean, you'd be surprised how many people that we have come and visit our firm who need help guiding them through a process where a loved one has passed and there is no documentation whatsoever. And then at that point, they're so concerned. They're like, what do I need to do to avoid this situation myself? Mm -hmm. um, and, and are kind of really interested at that point in getting an estate plan put together uh, so that they don't have anyone else have the same headache that they're having at that point in time. But when you have a no will, in place, the um, and you are a business person, and you have uh, closely held business assets. The problems can just multiply. So you're telling me, um, people will create an estate or create a trust, but they don't put anything in it. I mean, what's the point then? Um, there isn't one, but we get to have that fun scenario where we're dealing with a trust that kind of tells us once we get something into it, what we would do with those assets and then a whole bunch of assets outside of the trust that have to go through probate. So it's the worst of all worlds to deal with that. Um, and the will that they have at the time they signed their, do their documents only says that things would transfer over into the trust, but that doesn't actually mandate bank accounts or investments, uh, retirement assets, property, things that are specifically deeded or titled in such a way that they require a beneficiary designation. Have you had any clients do that, create a trust and not put anything in it? Of course. So we like to say that the trust is like a basket. Right. And they pay us to make a really nice, good, detailed basket about what they want to happen to the basket and how those assets are going to be passed out of the basket. But then they fail to go through the process of putting all of their assets into the basket. So they've paid all this money for a really really fancy basket that does nothing. 
Why wouldn't they want to do that at the time of the appointment with meeting with you? Well, that they these are not our clients. They're clients of other attorneys um, who were not guided through the oh, process for funding. So because something, Tucker Ellen wouldn't do that. We would never um, abandon our clients and um, not guide them through the funding process. So we talk about it in, in great detail, and we also offer services um, after the signing of their documents to guide them through the funding process. Okay, so you get the mess that someone else made. Correct. Okay. Yes. All right. Regularly. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. Now, I, I was talking to Missy earlier, and and given the Tony Shea's mental state, I mean, he clearly was having a mental health crisis, using drugs that were impacting his judgment, not making good decisions. And he was 46 years old, but the family could have clearly stepped in and said, look, we need guardianship, a conservatorship. He's not making good decisions. How difficult would it have been at his age? And, you know, because typically don't we see that more for, you know, say someone that's elderly and has dementia or Alzheimer's? Well, that's true. But if you look back even on, um, you know, a recent case that you guys may have visited with the Britney Britney Spears Spears, conservatorship, um, the bar for you know, actually appointing a guardian and conservator over someone who is young is very high. And they can contest that guardianship with representation. So, you know, Tony Shea may may have had a whole bunch of attorneys, clearly no estate planning attorneys, but probably a lot of other attorneys. And um, and so his family may have spoken to him about the possibility of getting someone else to manage his affairs. Um, and a couple of things can come into play with that with someone who has a lot of money, because as soon as the court gets involved, there's a lot of scrutiny as to how those funds are spent. Um, so if it was a contested guardianship, it could have gone on for a long time. But if the family members were also receiving some sort of financial uh, compensation or aid or support from uh, Tony Shea, he could have said, hey, if you file anything, I'm not going to help you out anymore. And if they had been appointed as guardians or conservators specifically um, over him, then they would have had to be have a high level of scrutiny over how they spent his money too. It could not have been for their benefit. So it does raise a couple of eyebrows, but you know, let's not get too hasty about blaming the family here because even though maybe they should have seen an attorney and they should have sought guardianship and conservatorship over him, uh, you know, caring about his health as well as the preservation of his wealth. Um, it's very hard to get in that combative relationship with somebody that you care about, whether they're old or they're young, but particularly when they're young and still functioning at a level where they, you know, are amassing wealth, but just not functioning personally on a very good level. And I could see where that would be a really difficult decision for, you know, especially a parent to make with an adult child. I mean, no, you don't want that type of friction in your family, but it does seem... now. Okay, what is the difference with a guardianship and a conservatorship? Is there any major difference? So a guardianship can have to do with um, a lot of healthcare decisions and where the person would live. And, you know, you're basically treating the person as a uh, as a child almost. Is that a good representation, Missy? Um, But with a conservatorship, it really strictly has to do with finances. Um, you know, that person basically has an estate. They have accounts and things like that. Right. Okay. And you're managing those and you're you're a steward um, of that. Um, so the bar is a little bit higher for getting declared a conservator, um, you know, versus a guardian. But oftentimes they happen at the same time. In this particular case, it would have definitely uh, been a filing for both. Okay. Okay. All right. The family won one legal battle against a uh, Jennifer Mimi Pham, the longtime friend, and her boyfriend, uh, Roberto Grande. There's also Tony Lee, his financial manager, that's suing for millions. Uh, Do you think they're going to have the same outcome? 
So when somebody is filing, you know, that that worked for the person and knew them pretty well, the bar for claiming um, that they had the capacity to contract, as Missy was discussing, at the time that they agreed to do certain things, um, whether that was, you know, certain fees or yearly amounts or for services that this man supposedly performed, um, Looking back, there there really probably wasn't capacity to agree to any of those things either way. So this is a way of basically not just by post-it note, verbal agreements, or even written agreements. I mean, at, in the mental state that he appeared to be, if he had gotten gone out and contracted to um, finance a very expensive car, chances are that wouldn't really hold up either if somebody were to challenge it. You really can't sign any legal documents when you don't understand what you were signing um, and you don't understand the ramifications going forward. Mm -hmm. Okay. I would not be surprised if the same thing happened. And do you think it would happen the same way, it, the same outcome as it did for uh, Mimi Pham and her boyfriend where they had to pay the family some money that Possibly. these other claimants, I mean, do you think they could actually be making money? There could be countersuits by the family. I mean, they're they're obviously going to be upset. This is a very traumatic event. So if they see all of these people that were around um, Tony and they, and he was being taken advantage of and they're digging through probably all of the belongings and all of these documents, you start to you know, you get you go to war at that point. And so they clearly have done that with respect to Mimi Fan. And so they, they may have documents against this financial planner as well. So the family is getting, you know, probably a little feisty and they've got good attorneys most likely um, lined up as well. I wonder if the family and even, you know, his circle of friends or business associates just assumed that he had his affairs in order. I mean... I, you would just think, I, I'm just, I find it baffling that he didn't have anything, you know, that he's this very successful entrepreneur. So I would think that others might have thought, okay, he's probably got it all spelled out. If the financial, I mean, if somebody was labeling themselves as a financial manager, we receive a lot of clients from people who have gone to see their financial advisor and their financial advisors is like, oh my goodness, you really need to get your estate plan in order. So it, there's a possibility of that assumption, but much more so that it, it's further proof that these people who were supposedly manage, managing other points of his finances were not trying to protect him or his assets moving forward. Okay. Yeah. It's going to be interesting to see how this all plays out. It really is. Once it, I mean, are we talking it, it, it could take years yeah, I, I agree. I, I definitely think that it will take that long for things to wrap up, um, particularly because this is going through litigation. Litigation, the thing that everyone wants to avoid um, after somebody passes. And litigation is backed up a lot just because of COVID and, and court dockets and whatnot, too. So even if it would have gotten done just slightly quicker um, at a different time right now is not a good time to try to push something through a court. Do you think there could be any criminal charges filed later on down the line? I, I want to ask both of you that. Sure, go ahead. Possibly. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if what they had against Mimi Fam were criminal charges um, of wrongdoing or possibly if they were sharing cell phones and addresses. Maybe she was doing things that she shouldn't have done fraudulently. If there's that degree of access to his funds, that's a very large temptation. Mm -hmm. What do you think? It'll be really interesting to see what happens in the civil cases. Obviously, in the one with Mimi Fan, it's getting ready to settle. So there are documents on file with the court. And it just depends on how uh, egregious they are and how easy it would be to prove. Um, the family, you know, I'm assuming would be fine with prosecuting anybody that comes up in this situation. So mm -hmm. I don't think that there will be a declination to prosecute if, if that arose. What about the night of the fire where, and I know the brother was involved and they were checking on him, you know, throughout that night. Could they be held liable in any way that they didn't, you know, call an ambulance for him knowing he was in there and they had already put out two small fires and, and clearly, you know, he was in some danger. Could they be held negligent in any way? I'm wondering. 
So if they didn't have any responsibility for his well-being other than common sense that you're, you know, you're wondering like what exactly was going on between siblings here possibly. But at the same time, somebody's panicking. Again, there's no duty to rescue um, somebody. So they can't, they don't have to put themselves in harm's way. Um, But it is a little strange that they didn't at least try to call someone right away. Um, knowing that. Um, it, it could be considered negligence. Um, it could be something that could be brought out to, to prove other things as the paperwork and whatnot is being discovered. Were these people arguing? Did somebody think they were going to be getting money if something yeah. happened to him? Um, but it's not a, an act in itself uh, to fail to save someone. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I get that. I just wonder, and I, I don't think that, you know, especially his brother, you know, there was anything, you know, he intended. For this. I don't think so. I don't think so either, I, you know, but I do think it was a poor decision not to call 911 and say, look, this man's having a mental health crisis. He's not in a good place. He's sleeping out in this shed and, you know, he's doing all these drugs and, you know, there were a couple of fires. He could hurt himself. We believe he's putting himself, you know, at risk of hurting himself. I, I think that would have been the wise thing to do, but you never know. And I mean, this was such a, a crazy situation. It really was. Okay. So any takeaways? Get an estate plan in place. Um, regardless of the size of your estate, the hassle, uh, particularly in relation to how much, you know, time and asset um, and, and information and, Just the hassle that somebody has to deal with working a full-time job, um, this is something that can really turn into its own full-time job taking care of the estate of a deceased family member. And it happens while you're already upset. Clearly, this family is going through a lot right now, but they're also now going through litigation and, and a lot of other complicated hassles. And so if you think that can't happen to you, it can. Um, just hopefully not to this scale. Right. And we've talked before on the show, Missy, and it, you don't have to be someone with an enormous amount of wealth. You or know? really any wealth. You just, lots of people, even someone with no money needs to get like a financial power of attorney or healthcare power of attorney in place. So that way if something does happen to them, and then we're hoping that it would never be anything crazy like this with drug abuse or something, but accidents happen. You want to have something in place. Right. Exactly. Okay. Well, ladies, thank you for joining today. We hope to have you both back soon. Thank you, Joe. Thank Thanks, you. Jill. That's been another episode of Life's Third Act. Take care. You've been listening to Life's Third Act, a podcast for thriving in retirement. Sponsored by Tucker Allen, your estate and elder law advisors. Each week, we discuss topics and answer questions to help you better plan for your future. For more information, visit TuckerAllen.com. Subscribe and listen again next week for another edition of Life's Third Act. The choice of a lawyer is an important decision and should not be based solely on advertisements.